this thing on? I had a few surgeries on my eye. I had a detached retina. It's no fun. And the last surgery was a real doozy. A lot of people have a lot of things worse than me, so I'm not going to complain. It's kind of a cross-section of guitars that have kind of gone um, forgotten. I'm talking about Japanese guitars, and not just any Japanese guitars, but pretty much these guitars of the middle quality to the higher quality. And specifically today, I have five guitars, five great specimens, and um, I have four Yamahas and an Alvarez Yari. Now, somebody said to me one time, they said, that's a great guitar if it just didn't say Yamaha on it. They meant no disrespect to Yamaha, because Yamaha is a great company. They were referring to the fact that there were just so many Yamahas in the market. Um, they kind of flooded the market back in the 70s, 80s, 90s with kind of lower, good starter guitars. You know, they were great for that. Um, and I guess through the years, with all the other competition here in the United States, some of the higher end stuff kind of went unnoticed. Um, so that's what I'm doing today. I'm not going to go into detail about the bracing. Uh, I don't know enough about all the woods. I know some. Um, I'm just going to show you a few models that I discovered in the last several months during my rehabilitation. You know, if you play country music or Americana music, which is super popular in America, of course, right now, a lot of artists in that genre maybe might not use a Japanese guitar because they want to, you know, they're carrying on the tradition of that original American music. So in the studio, would you know the difference? No. But live, I understand the whole vibe of uh, playing a Gibson or a Martin guitar, and they're wonderful instruments too. The idea that Johnny Cash or Hank Williams would play a Japanese guitar is a little strange. And... But yeah, so I get it. I just think maybe that's another reason that they kind of get overlooked. I remember back in high school, uh, even back then we had Yamaha guitars. I have a picture here of me playing with my friend Robbie at a concert in 1973 at Auburn High School Auditorium. And she was playing a little red label FG-180 at the time. Uh, let me get started with the early 70s um, FG-180. It's called a red label because it has a red label, which kind of makes sense, on the inside here. And you can still find them on eBay for $300 to $600, depending on how much somebody wants to um, check out the price because it's old and has a red label. Now, one thing to look out for with these guitars is some of the necks needed resetting, which can cost you more than the guitar itself, uh, depending on where you take it. Uh, I got lucky with this one. It didn't need it. I just lowered it uh, here at the bridge, and it was um, plenty long enough for me to play it. One thing I did notice when I first recorded with it was how... How do I explain this? It kind of records flat. It doesn't naturally have a lot of bottom end or a lot of brilliant highs. It, for some reason, reminded me of those old NS10 speakers that everybody had back in the 90s. They were kind of affordable, and they were kind of flat, but they, they reproduced the song, you know, without any uh, coloration. Uh, I think anybody will tell you that it's a lot easier to add bottom end to a, an acoustic guitar than it is to try to take bottom end out, I mean, without losing some of the earthiness and the soul of the guitar. So I'm gonna try to play some here. I'm gonna record it in my Logic sessions and see if I can do it this way so you get a better idea of what it sounds like. And I'm going to turn off my air conditioner because it's running like crazy. I just realized that. Ah, better. Hotter, but better. Okay, so this is the FG 180 Yamaha.
pretty cool. You know, I may have heard at one time that Jimmy Page used these guitars too. I know he used old harmonies and Gibsons, but I think in his his arsenal of guitars back then, I think he had an FG-180 if I'm not wrong. Anyway, check them out, they're affordable and they're all over the place, you can still get them and they're fun to have around the house, they're good for everything. Now this guitar, um, when I first picked up this guitar, the first thing I noticed was that it felt substantial. It had a kind of a weight to it. It just felt really solid. Um, it's because of the ebony fretboard. And like on all these guitars I'm getting ready to show you, they, the, the remainder four guitars I'm gonna show you all have ebony fretboards. Um, they all are perfectly straight and true. I like my action as low as my Les Pauls on my, um, on my acoustic guitars. So this one came out great. Now when I got this one, the bridge, I could see it was lifted a little bit. I could get a business card, if we saw business cards, um, uh, between it and the top. Instead of pulling off the whole top and trying to re-glue it, which would be beyond my pay grade, I just and kind of sanded it with some sandpaper, um, making sure I didn't scuff up the top any more than it already is. Squeeze some glue in there, and then I found these old clamps in the backyard that didn't quite fit. And I put these little extenders on them that were that went to the back of the bridge, clamped it down. I could see the glue kind of squish out, so I knew it was a tight bond. Um, and I used tight bond glue to glue it down with. And um, the next day, it, it was great. I adjusted the neck straight. I lowered the action like I do, and it's a wonderful guitar. I, I believe this one had a nickname uh, or name it was given to it called the Silver Lark. Um, not really quite sure. Maybe it's a little lighter wood. I don't know, but it's um, walnut sides, which I think maybe makes for the little mellow more sound that it has. Um, a DY-52. I'm assuming DY means Dreadnought Yari. 52 means... I don't know. But this is the Alvarez Yari DY-52. kind of a cool thing. I was in a, another store called Ventura Music and uh, George Wells has surprises for me. Went in the back and says, Alan, look at this. And he brought this guitar out and once again I needed a little bridge work which I was able to, to tighten down. Besides that, uh, it was perfect. This is a 1980s L10 and I came to find out that L in Japanese guitar means luxury. So it's a luxury 10. 
Um, once again, it has a real substantial neck. The neck in this guitar reminds me of like some of the Guild. It's a very nice, manly neck on these guitars. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's a dreadnought, so it's going to have a little bit more of a, a the full-bodied sound. Uh, lots of nice bottom, lots of brilliant um, high-end. And uh, once again, it just plays great. I think it looks cool. You can get these from anywhere from... Oh gosh, I mean on eBay you never know. But you can get these from anywhere from like eight hundred bucks to twelve hundred bucks, which again is not super cheap. I mean I'm not talking forty five dollars here when I talk about affordable. I'm comparing these to the other guitars, the American made brands that are like sometimes six times as much money. And I think uh, these are just as good of guitars. Anyway, having said that, let's listen to the L ten. This is from the eighties. on this guitar, I realized that there was another model, well, it was the same model, but it was from 10 years before, called the L10, um, and I was curious the difference. I had read some places, maybe it was made with Jacaranda, which some people said was a name the Japanese um, kind of gave to Brazilian Rosewood, or somebody said Jacaranda's uh, kind of close to the Brazilian rainforest, but it's some other kind of wood, who knows. But uh, I was curious, and I just happened to find one online, so I said, Hmm. Only one way to find out. So I bought the 1970s, same model. And the one thing I noticed visually, um, visibly, is that the um, inlays on these are a little, or like they're made out of wood or something. They're a little bit darker. Maybe they're clay inlays, like the clay dots on the Stratocasters, right from the pre-CBS stuff. Um, the wood looks the same to me on the sides, but this guitar does have a little mellower vibe to it, as you'll hear in a second. This is the L10, but from the 70s, 10 years before the last one I just played. Thank you. 
Colt Han, and maybe it's a little richer sounding than the 80s, right? Um, but they're both great guitars, and they both have around the same price range, uh, depending whether it's the 70s or the 80s. <laughs> favorite of all my Yamaha guitars is this one and this is the LL36 so I guess it means luxury luxury 36 I don't know but um it's a great shape guitar it's a little bit more almost like a little bit more of a parlor size a little bit rounder uh, shoulders a little thinner here but it's got a little depth there in the back guitars. these actually had a certain uh, process done to it called ARE um, which stands for Acoustic Resonance Enhancement, which what they did, they put this into a big sound chamber and bombarded it with, uh, with tomatoes. Now they bombarded it with a uh, sound, of course, and uh, the idea was to make it sound and play and, and uh, resonate like um, a guitar that had been around on the planet for a hundred years. So I think it may have worked. I mean, I don't know. I never played the guitar without that being done to it, but, um, there seems to be something to that. I know my brother used to play bassoon when I was a kid, and he told me that the really uh, expensive bassoons that people would make, they would they would give them to the London Symphony Orchestra to have somebody of high talent and with a good ear and great technique play them for 20 years, uh, just so that the next buyer, so it, the instrument in the long run would be um, would be a much better instrument. So there's something to that test. I've never seen some pictures someplace in Downbeat or some magazine where they had some, a guitar that had been played, a guitar that wasn't, same piece of wood. Uh, and the cellular, the way the cells changed, uh, were definitely different uh, in the played guitar. So anyway, um, that's the selling feature of this guitar. And besides, it's beautiful. It has a little bit of the D45 kind of bling bling uh, binding on it. It has like a nice wooden soft uh, binding um, on the neck, which is just kind of aesthetically kind of pleasing. It's not as big of, as a neck as the uh, L10 is. It's more of a, this feels more contemporary. It's a little bit slimmer. It's more, more comfortable than the L10. It's, it seems to have everything the Dreadnoughts do, plus it seems to be very mellow and very pronounced in the low mids, which I happen to like a whole lot. So, without further ado, this is the uh, L, 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 no, I'm sorry, there's only two L's, LL36. So there you have it. These are um, great guitars. Yeah, if you were in the studio playing these guitars, and nobody listening would ever go, oh, is that a Yamaha? 
because they don't. They're good sounding guitars, no matter whether they're made in made in Japan or on Pluto. You know, they're great instruments. You use your ear, and you don't care about the stigma or the or the name brand or the Americana look or whatever. Uh, the Yamaha guitars, I think, from the the mid quality to the really high level stuff, um, are really great deals, great uh, bargains. Uh, and you can still find them all over the place. Trust me on this one. All right, guys. See you next time. <laughs>